<laughs> all right we're live oh hey all right well hey good afternoon everyone welcome to uh another session uh, another leadership jam session i got uh siac number three john wayne troxel retired sergeant major u.s army um oh. John and I have known each other about four years now. Actually, yeah. it's almost like to the day four years. If I remember <laughs> the conversation at dinner uh, yeah. when we were, you came to visit Recruit Training Command, we were talking about the election at dinner. So we're not going to do that today. We're going <laughs> to stay away from politics. But uh, it's great to see you, brother. I, I wish that uh, we could be you know, in the same room, but this is, this is as, just as good. Uh, I'm really honored that you were you were excited to come on and do this with me. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of go through a bunch of stuff, and, and and for the for everyone watching, this is organic. Everything that we do on Motivate is very organic. Uh, even just the development of the page has been organic. Leadership Jam session wasn't something that I had envisioned when we started this. Uh, it just came to be through different conversations with other leaders, and uh, here we are today. So we're just going to talk. Uh, you can be a fly on the wall and listen to two guys just chat. You know, our experiences are unique. And uh, maybe you can take something away from these and, uh, and, and get some stuff uh, that uh, you can put in your own toolbox. All right. So uh, let, me, let me talk about John Wayne Troxel here. Sergeant Major retired, 37 years in the Navy, uh, married to Sandra. Uh, and he's got three sons and four grandchildren. You have four grandchildren, John? Absolutely. That's awesome. Absolutely. And I, got, I have one. Do you get to see them often? Yeah, I, I live around my children. So uh, um, every Thursday we get our youngest granddaughter. We see our oldest grandson and granddaughter every day. And about once a week, my other grandson we get to see. So, yeah, we, we see family a lot here. That's great. So that's why you moved back to where you're at? Yeah. All my sons settled down in the Joint Base Lewis-McChord area uh, where I had served previously at the 06 level and at the 09 level. So. Um, yeah, so we, the wife and I settle down out here and, uh, so we get a healthy dose of grandkids out here and we love it. That's fantastic. Speaking of your beautiful wife, Sandra, didn't you just celebrate a anniversary? Yes. Uh, two days ago, uh, was our 37th, uh, wedding anniversary. Wow. And, uh, I met her when I was an E1 in, uh, six months after we got, after we met, uh, we got married. And we've been together ever since. She's been with me the whole way. We've served overseas a total of 11 years together. And as the SEAC, she did a lot of traveling with me to some places that spouses normally don't get to go, like Iraq, Afghanistan, Turkey, and other places like that. So, yeah, our 37th anniversary and uh, hoping for 37 more. <laughs> uh, I, I'm rooting for you, man. I, you know, I, so... I make a joke all the time at work that I'm a fully qualified command master chief because I've been divorced <laughs> twice and married three times. Uh, but uh, honestly, to be completely honest, I envy a guy like you that, you know, you got it right the first time. It took me three times to get it right. You, you know, Heather, I'm married to an angel. I'm Absolutely. living heaven on earth. But, um, you know, how, how, how did you do that? Especially with three sons, because she's three sons with you gone a lot. She's going to heaven no matter what she does, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So how, um, how how do you get to 37 years doing what you did for 37 years? So I think it, first of all, for Sandra, it comes from her upbringing. She's a, you know, second generation uh, Mexican-American. Her father was from Chihuahua, Mexico. Her mother was from uh, Texas and they got married and he, be, he did, he became a citizen, the the legal way, you know, they had 19 kids. Wow. My mother and father-in-law had 19 kids in 23 years. So you have a traditional Mexican family. They grew up, you know, lower middle class, almost at the poverty level at times. And uh, her upbringing taught her how to, you know, endure hardships and everything. And here I am, this kid that grew up in Iowa, you know, to a middle class family, you know, and, uh, I, you know, I, I had the ability to run around and act stupid and, you know, and, and play football and wrestle, but drink beer and stuff like that. And when we met, it was almost like, uh, you know, there was divine intervention in my life. And I had this woman that came in 
that was just beautiful inside and out. And, uh, and, and I instantly fell in love. And so I think it was, she already had it built in, uh, you know, on how to endure hardship. And, and I'll give you a good example is uh, 1989 peacetime military. I'm in the 82nd Airborne Division. I'm on Division Ready Force One, which means that uh, we have to be on alert, one hour alert, and uh, and then anywhere, wheels up anywhere in the world, 18 hours or less to go into combat. And this was December 1989. And I left, start of half day schedule that morning and said, hey, I'll be home at lunch. We can go shopping for the kids and everything. Well, I got to work and, uh, you know, the, the balloon went up and we got alerted. And next thing you know, we were parachuting into combat in Operation Just Cause in Panama. And she was one of those spouses that was, you know, providing assistance, providing comfort to other spouses that weren't handling this no notice combat deployment, you know, and it was during a peacetime military. So, you know, there was only about 5,000 troops that were engaged in that combat operation. And that there showed me that, boy, this, this lady can endure a lot. And ever since then, you know, with Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and a couple of brutal tours in Iraq and Afghanistan where we lost a, plenty of troops. And she was at every funeral, every memorial service and everything. Mm. And then our wounded, she would go to the hospitals and watch our wounded go through their physical therapy and everything. She has just been a, a just a model, you know, and now I'm a little biased, you know, but she's a model for what we <laughs> want out of a military spouse. And uh, even as the SEAC, you know, she would travel around the world with me, but she would still take time, you know, to meet with the, the previous and current administration, first ladies and second ladies, talk about military programs. She would uh, do, you know, reading to children at the schools, and uh, she still and volunteered at the thrift shop and, and the USO and other places for 30 hours a week, you know. And uh, so, I mean, it hasn't always been beer and Skittles, you know, through 37 years, <laughs> you know. But uh, um, but we we made a commitment to each other. And I think in, in any relationship, when you make a commitment to each other and you stand by that commitment, it will endure time, circumstance and adversity. And, and yeah, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking, man, how how do you pay that back, right? So I I married Heather uh, in October of 2011, and I was on my way to Afghanistan six months later, and yeah, you know, and and she had I was already a command master chief when we got married. I was at the ceremonial guard uh, when she when we got married, and I always say that I I went to Afghanistan because I needed a less hostile environment, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, DC, it, it is what it oh, is, yeah. but, uh, you know, I, you, and she was a rock, you know, she raised, my son was living with me when she started dating me. And then, yeah, you know, and she knew that my intent was to, to take advantage of the opportunity. Cause there weren't a lot of sailors that, you know, had that, that opportunity to serve boots on the ground. And I, but we did start, send 30,000 and it was something I wanted to do because I knew I still had legs in the Navy. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I jockeyed to get into position to, to take a job over in, uh, in Afghanistan. So she stepped up, you know, instantly and, and took, took it on. And, you know, uh, one of the hardest stories that I tell is Skype was that that's the difference between a boots on the ground deployment and an, in an, and an, on the ship deployment yeah. is Skype, right? You have internet in your room or, or whatever, so we get to Skype a lot. My son was misbehaving. We'll just put it that way. He was a senior in high school. <laughs> so we had the family talk, you know, Yeah. And, um, in the middle of the family talk, the whole, the whole, the whole, uh, uh, B hut just went boom. Right. And, uh, she said, what, what was that? And I said, uh, you heard that? She says, yeah. And next thing you know, the, the alert was going off incoming. Oh yeah. Incoming. <laughs> yeah. I gotta go. And I slammed Little incoming. Yeah. 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 So I slammed the computer down and you know how it is. You get comfortable over there. I just kind of stuck my head out the door and listened and all clear was sounded that, you know, I didn't yeah. go into the bunker at that point. And, uh, so I called him back and she said that my son, uh, 
who was misbehaving at the time basically said, what do we do? And she said, we pray. Yeah. And, um, so this, that's the part that gets me all choked up. And, uh, my, the funny part of that is he didn't misbehave the rest of the time I was gone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, there's that what they go through I, I, is, is you can't pay that back, you know, and that's kind of what uh, I was. Yeah. About. Right. I mean, it's priceless. The the work that they put in and the things that they do. I mean, raising three sons, uh, you know, on, on your side is just absolutely amazing. And you can't thank them enough. You can't can't buy enough flowers. You can't give enough back rubs or, or yeah. you know, there's just nothing you can do to repay. Well, you know, I have a great story uh, kind of similar to yours. Um so in 2007 and eight, I was surge brigade number four in Iraq when President Bush sent five extra army brigades and two extra marine brigades into Iraq uh, to combat the civil war and, and to make this push to stabilize the nation. And uh, my brigade, we went into an area where in the first seven days, I made eight trips to the morgue with my commander to identify remains of our troops that have been fallen in battle and everything. Meanwhile, back at home. So every day I'm calling Sandra saying, Hey, we lost another soldier today, you know, um, you know, and she is working through that casualty notification process. And if there were families there on the base, she's assisting with, you know, comfort and stuff like that. Well, whatever, all, all of our spouses, the number one thing they fear is those two sedans that will come through the neighborhood with people in their service alpha uniforms, including a chaplain, a casualty notification officer, some rear detachment folks or whatever, and they're getting out to come and do the notification that their service member has been killed in action. So my wife was out in front of our quarters reading a book, you know, trying to, you know, get her mind off of, you know, this so far one weekend brutal combat tour that was going on. And she's reading a book and these two sedans come driving down the road and they pulled up right in front of our house. And immediately her thought was, well, John's been killed in action. And she, you know, went in and told the kids, you know, go to your rooms, you know, and everything. And they actually got out and they went to my next door neighbor's house. My good oh. friend, Sergeant Major Brad Connor, who was in Iraq at the same time as me in a different location. And Brad had been killed by an improvised explosive device. and. Sandra said, you know, you know, the worst thing in the world is to lose a loved one. She said, but to listen to Brad's wife, uh, the, the screams and wails after she was notified. And now she in turn went from someone in a split second that thought her husband had been killed in action to now she was providing aid and comfort to our next door neighbor's spouse and their children because mm -hmm. their father and, and husband had been killed in action. And you can't, you're exactly right, Izzy, you can't pay that back. That, I mean, we see it at ground level, you know, when something bad happens and the flag draped coffins go, but the fallout, because guess what, that flag draped coffin, and I don't mean to sound callous, the minute it's on the plane and we've honored that person, we're strapping it back on and we're getting back after the mission, whatever it is. And uh, now the spouses have to deal with the aftermath. And right. you're exactly right, you cannot pay that back which is why, you know, our military spouses are the, some of the strongest people that our nation has ever seen. Amen. Yeah, I, I agree. So we talked a lot about family and I know we yeah. touched on both of our careers a bit. So let's, let's talk about your, your career. It was uh, long and storied, if you will. <laughs> uh, you said that uh, we were chatting earlier. You said you were a senior, uh, you were a sergeant, command sergeant major for two decades. 20 years. 20 years. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I brag on my, my almost 13. And uh, <laughs> now I feel like, a, like a, I'm, I'm back in diapers here. So uh, yeah. let's just talk about your leadership tours. I mean, uh, you, it, it, you mentioned that you, you did parachute into Panama, which is, uh, I, I watched your video when you were SEAC, by the way, when you visited yeah. the area that uh, you actually parachuted into and yeah. fought. Uh, yeah. that, that was amazing. Uh, that yeah, was it was video. it was 29 years, Izzy, after I had not been back to Panama in 29 years. Mm. And so uh, the U.S. Southern Command senior enlisted leader, Brian Zikafus, invited me to come down. You know, we went to Panama, Honduras, 
Colombia, some other uh, countries. But uh, when I went to Panama, the Panamanians were wide open. They they took me out. Uh, they they took me back to where you know we parachuted in at. They took me back to where I I fought at on Tinajitas Hill and everything. And I got up on top of that hill, and that the hairs were just up on my arms and on the back of my neck because I was looking down off that hill like I had looked down 29 years ago, and, you know, firing at Panamanian Defense Force officials and everything. And I looked down there and I'm looking at the same terrain. So it was, yeah, it was a, an awesome and surreal moment to be back there. I've, uh, so the funny part, not, I don't know if it's funny, but uh, so you've only been to Panama twice. I think I've been to Panama city probably 10 times. No <laughs> kidding. I flew my first wife down there for a weekend R and R when we were in port. Uh, so between about 96 and uh, 2000, I did uh, five counter drug operations deployments down to the Caribbean and the Western Pacific. So yeah, uh, Panama city was like my second home. So, yeah. <laughs> I, but you know, in 2018, when I went back, it was the first time that I landed in an airplane on Torrijos Airport. The last time I came in by parachute so, <laughs> under the same airport, Torrijos Airport. A little bit so. better visit the second time, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about your your uh, your command tours. Um, you know, uh, what uh, what what do you draw from from those that experience that that you know that kind of has shaped your life? Because I know that there's a lot of stuff. I've done seven personally. I'm in my seventh tour now, but. Um, you know, and you have too many to really read off. I have your bio yeah. sitting here, but, yeah. uh, you know, tell me about a couple of experiences that kind of shape how you, you know, the, the, the name of the page is motivate with this. So tell me yeah. some of those things that, that you, you draw from that help you get motivated even today. Yeah. So the, the, uh, fortunate thing for me is that because of just cause and desert shield, desert storm, I had two combat tours as a, you know, a, a, an enlisted person, you know, both at the rank of E6. And, um, and then I served in the 82nd Airborne Division as a first sergeant and everything. So I was part of a rapid deployable force. So I, I had all of these experiences uh, prior to becoming a command sergeant major that had set me up. And then 9-11 um, happened and uh, I became a uh, squadron level command sergeant major in the 10th mountain division. And so I knew then that the the world that we lived in after 9-11 was going to be different. We were going to be an expeditionary military. You know, I think our Navy's always been expeditionary because you guys are always doing missions all over the world. But for our joint force, we were truly going to be expeditionary now. And so that kind of helped me up. And so as a squadron level sergeant major, I did a tour in Iraq, um, which uh, helped uh, helped me immensely to in, in terms of leadership to be able to continue to operate at, at future levels. So as a, a battalion sergeant major, squadron level, I served in Iraq, came back. I stood up a striker brigade combat team, which I said before um, is uh, I was surge brigade number four in Iraq under General Bert Bush's or President Bush's surge. And so I went to Iraq again as a brigade level command sergeant major. And, and then uh, I went back, to, I went to Afghanistan as the ISAF joint command, command sergeant major, the sergeant major of all combat forces there in mm -hmm. 2011 and 12. So I think one thing I learned and one thing that I, I've, I've never forgotten and one thing I preach now through my leadership seminars is you know, leadership by example at the strategic level has to be the same way it is at the tactical level. So the same leadership that you use for those third class petty officers and lower at the, you know, the 05 level or whatever, at the 06, 07 level, it's got to be the same way. And even as the SEAC, when, uh, you know, Secretary Mattis came in and President Trump did the fire and fury speech about North Korea, and, you, you know, we all of a sudden now our focus was on North Korea and looking at the enormity of the troops that we would have. And Secretary Matt is telling me, I need to know what the readiness uh, of the troops is, you know, and, and we had some challenges there with 17. Per, you and I had this discussion when I came to visit you uh, in Great Lakes. 17 percent of our force was non-deployable 
or could was not physically able to do their mission that they had signed up for. And so, uh, you know, I, I told Secretary Madison, General Dumford, the best thing we can do at this level is to support the services going forward. But General Dunford and I, through our example of what fitness is and everything. And so I made a point to get after the PME hard. General Dunford and I did the Marine Corps Marathon together. Uh, we did a lot of fitness events together. And we wanted to make sure that everything that we expected out of every soldier, sailor, airman, Marine, and Coast Guardsman at the tactical level, we better be emulating at the strategic level or we would be hypocritical to any leaders in between us mm -hmm. because we're not doing what we expect them to do. And I think that's out of my 20 years of command positions. One thing that transcended the tactical operational strategic level was the need to be a leader that leads through example more so, more so than what I say. It's what I do more so than what I say. Yeah. I, you know, I, I looked it up because, uh, um, communication, right? Any any form of communication is uh, is fifty percent, fifty five percent body language, in uh, in yeah. that it's uh, uh, only seven percent of actual what you say, right? Yeah, so the fifty five percent is body language, and and you know when when you're you're leading and you, you don't say anything, just put your uniform on, right? Yes. I did a nine eleven ceremony on the ship today, and I put my whites on. And the way I look in my whites, uh, sailors are watching. They're looking. They want to see what you look like. And if, Absolutely. You're, if you're hanging out over the top of your belt <laughs> or you can't see your belt buckle, uh, then, then, you know. Or anything you know, below your belt buckle. Right. The other, that 7% that you say that actually comes out of your mouth doesn't have the weight of the other 55%, um, you know, because, uh, and the rest is inflection and, and, and that 38% is inflection. But the, you, you've got to present the whole package when you communicate in, in that Absolutely. 55%, that body language, a lot of it comes from the way you look in the way you present yourself. And yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I love that. So you mentioned PME hard and yeah. I think that you, you were already kind of getting after PME, but PME oh, yeah. hard really grew through 16 and seven, 2016 and 2017. And it became kind of its its own thing, like P Absolutely. hashtag PME hard. Uh, I, I know that uh, so, somebody who follows me on the page is like, oh, I can't wait to hear him talk about PME hard, <laughs> right? So yeah. it it really became its own thing. So yeah, um, you know how did how did you know I was talking about how the page is organic. How did PME hard hard grow into what it is today? So it all started uh, during the surge in Iraq in two thousand seven and eight. I mean, through that 15 month combat deployment, I lost 54 soldiers. I had 500 that were severely wounded. And, but I saw, you know, you're, you were putting over a hundred pounds of kit. I mean, same thing in Afghanistan, you know, that all the kit we were wearing, and then we were negotiating rock walls, the palm groves, and just rough terrain uh, to get out and get into the enemy's uh, security zone to take the fight to them so mm -hmm. that they couldn't take the fight to us on the roads with IEDs and everything. And I saw um, how the toll it was taking on my troops. And I had been training, functional training prior to that. And I would go out on patrol with some of my platoons and I would see guys bending over, you know, to get relief on their back because of the combat gear. And I know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I'm still on a knee and I'm, I'm like, I'm the brigade command sergeant major. And I, I said to myself, I need troops that need to that have, to, you know, because I said, you can't just be fit. I need them to be physically, mentally, and emotionally hard to deal with the conditions on the worst day of their life, which at the time was against an insidious enemy that would use children and women, you know, to uh, assist them in their endeavors uh, to do attacks on us or to protect themselves and everything. And I said, we need service members that are physically, mentally, and emotionally hard. And the foundation is the physical part and being physically fit and everything. So I just coined this phrase at the time, PME hard, and I started using it. And it, it didn't really take off. I mean, people understood it because I was doing things like Mangadai leader exercises where I would take my senior enlisted leaders out uh, wherever I was at in Korea. 
at Joint Base Lewis McCord at Fort Knox for a little 72 hour mini ranger school. I call it validating our credentials to lead the men and women of our nation. And I will tell you, um, when people think that the Navy doesn't do stuff like this because, you know, they're at sea, a good friend of mine, Fleet Master Chief Jim Honia, did three of my Mongodai warrior exercises with me in Korea. And that big grizzly bear would throw a rucksack on his back and he would get out on the mountains and everything. And he would be pushing not only sailors, but soldiers, Marines and airmen as well. But the point being was um, I wanted to continue to push this being hard and, and the definition of hard being not soft or easily penetrable. So I, I just continue to apply that as a part of my leadership philosophy. And until I took over as the SEAC and Secretary Mattis came in and this was, you know, you know, fire and fury that it, I, I realized we really got to get after PME hard because we had a force at the time, 17 percent of three million. That's like half a million troops that could not deploy to do their job. Mm -hmm. And that was a that was a security challenge if we had to do an operation in North Korea. So I just continued to promote it and uh, and it just continued to get traction. And mm -hmm. and, you know, and much like, uh, you know, you're doing with what you're doing here with um, Motivate, you know, I started making T-shirts and everything. And uh, and now I'm, I'm you know, I've got bandanas and everything, by the way. We get done here, send me your mailing address so I can send you a couple. But uh, the point being was it, it was it was resonating with the troops because yeah. they they knew that in order to continue to deal with this being in an expeditionary military and back to back deployments, whether it was, you know, in the Navy, seven to nine months at a time or the Army, you know, nine months at a time or Marines, six months or airmen, four to six months. They knew it was going to continue to go and that. Uh, the enemy always gets a vote. They knew they had to be ready uh, for the conditions that could happen on their worst day of their life. So it just uh, it continued to grow. And uh, and uh, and it really kind of took off, uh, you know, once I gave ISIS their ultimatum, you know, uh, of surrender or die, then that kind of took off. And then it was PME hard and surrender or die after that, you know. Yeah, that's ironic. That's exactly what we were going to talk about next. Boom! I got it Look right here. I got it right there. Uh, that is, is awesome. I, this is a long sleeve shirt. It's it's actually one of my favorite motorcycle riding shirts because I'm still active duty and I have to wear the long sleeve shirt. Follow the go. rules. But uh, that is one of my favorites. So talk to me about Surrender or Die and the E Tool Nation. Yeah. So uh, when I, as the SEAC, you know, the, the position of the SEAC, uh, it's not like the Mick Pond or the Sergeant Major of the Army where you have authority to focus on things like service member programs or uniform policy and stuff like that. As the SEAC, you aren't in the science of policy or anything. You are clearly in the art of influence, the art of motivation, the art of inspiration, and providing best military advice to the chairman and secretary of defense. And so my main role was to go out and travel around and visit troops, much like when I came to visit you at, uh, you know, and that was based on Secretary Mattis saying, hey, go out to recruit training and tell me how we're doing out there, you know. And uh, as I started traveling around and then I would have engagements with Congress and the administration, I started sensing that we were kind of taking our eye off the ball of the sacrifice that our service members were making around the world. Mm -hmm. It was not, you know, intentionally happening, but I wanted to make sure that back in Washington, D.C., we understood the sacrifices that the men and women of the military were making. So long story short, I was in Raqqa, Syria for the fall of Raqqa. As a matter of fact, my story when I go to a bar is I showed up in Raqqa, Syria, and four days later, ISIS surrendered. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but anyways, seriously, though, I was with some of our most elite special operators, and uh, I'm on a roof in Raqqa, Syria. And here we have the Syrian Democratic Force, our, the Kurds, our partners, moving to contact, just schwacking ISIS with U.S. advisors. We have Marine Corps artillery just pummeling them with, uh, you know, our, our artillery rounds. Uh, we have Army Rangers firing mortars. We have attack aviation and close air support. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, close air support 
just pummeling them, and they were still holding out. The minute there was a pause in the fight, ISIS would come out with a suicide bomber or a suicide vehicle born IED. And so finally, I'm up there, you know, I got a couple of senior uh, sergeant majors or senior enlisted with me. And I said, you know, some, you know, excuse my language. I said, you know, these assholes got two options, me and ISIS. They can surrender or die. And I said, hey, look, if they surrender, we'll treat them humanely. You know, we'll, you know, safeguard them to a detainee holding facility cell, give them a cot, three hots and due process. I said, but the bottom line is if they don't surrender, we are going to kill them with extreme prejudice. And whether that's dropping bombs on them, shooting them, and shooting them in the face, or if need be, beating them to death with our entrenching tools, you know, our shovels. And so one of the sergeant majors says to me, hey, you ought to put that in your report to General Dunford and Secretary Mattis. So I did that. And Mattis wrote back and said, keep saying that. That fits into his narrative. And if you remember at the time, his narrative was, we're not going to defeat our enemies. We're going to annihilate them. Mm -hmm. You know, annihilate was the word he wanted to use and it fit into that. So I would travel around with him or General Dunford and and I would constantly say it. And, it, you know, the troops loved it. It was there to inspire the troops and, you know, to intimidate our enemies a little bit. And it never took off until Christmas Day two years ago. I'm in Bagram, Afghanistan on a USO tour with General Dunford. And I'm on stage doing what General Dunford wants me to do, fire up the troops. And I've been saying surrender or die wherever we've gone on this USO tour. Just happened to be a Washington Post reporter at the Bagram at the time. So I got up there. I've got an entrenching tool. Medal of Honor recipient Flo Groberg is with me. He's got an entrenching tool. General Dunford kind of gives his spiel. He turns it over to me. I kind of gave him my motivational speech. And uh, afterwards, this reporter comes up to me and says, hey, I can't believe that you're advocating for war crimes, for our troops to commit war crimes. I said, let me tell you something, sir. We train our service members how to use non-standard weapons to kill enemy threats, okay? And they have the inherent right for self-defense, all the stuff that we mm-hmm. know, you know? And the guy says, well, I'm going to go lie. I'm going to I'm gonna publish this, you know, because I think this is wrong. And I said, well, knock yourself out, dude. And then I kind of walked away and caught myself and I said, oh, shit. What am I going to do now? And so I called up my public affairs guy, Rob Kotor, who you know came to came with me to visit you yep. in uh, Great Lakes. And Rob was back home. It was Christmas Day. He's opening presents with his family and everything. And I said, Rob, I may have a problem here. I said, I've been doing Surrender or Die and never been a problem. Now there's Washington Post reporters, you know, kind of got his panties in an uproar. What are we going to do? He said, <laughs> let's beat him to the punch. He said, have... Uh, MC1, Don Pinero, who was the chairman's photographer, have him send a photo of you holding the e-tool and I will publish your quote on social media with that picture. So the picture is me holding an e-tool and I got my trigger finger extended, you know, good trigger (laughs) finger discipline, (laughs) even on a shovel, brother. And uh, and it's it's got troops in the background and KOTOR made the post. He did the hashtag ISIS surrender or die, hashtag E-Tool Nation, and it went viral. I mean, it went, you know, every major news organization, international news. Or- I yeah. shared it. Yeah, it was just, and uh, and that's where it started. That's where the T-shirts started. I had nothing to do with the T-shirts, yeah, the Surrender or Die T-shirts, the coffee cups, all of this stuff started. And then the same MC1. So people think an entrenching tool is an Army and Marine Corps weapon. The first entrenching tool I ever signed was by mass communicator first class, Dom Pinero, the chairman, you know, a, a sailor. He brings in an e-tool to me. I signed it. We published that. And next thing you know, I'm, I've been getting, as a matter of fact, brother, I got another e-tool right here. So <laughs> the e-tool nation now has become uh, synonymous with the warrior ethos, you know, and mm-hmm. that by any means necessary, we will defend our freedom, our homeland, and our way of life. And I've signed almost 900 of these things now. And I continue to do it because in the end, um, it's about inspiring the troops and intimidating the enemy. And that's what it was all about. I wasn't doing it to gain fame or notoriety or anything. As a matter of fact, I gained more ass pain from this in Washington, D.C., from, you know, the media and from, you know, 
people lean in a certain direction in Congress and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it really was uh, more of a pain than I, it, it should have been. But in the end, it was about inspiring the troops. And uh, as you I know you are the same way. If this inspires the troops, I'll do it till my last day. And uh, uh, the other thing Make I no learned apologies about it. Make yeah, no, no apologies. apologies. You know, no. I, I, you know, I'm a big UFC fighter, and uh, I, I like to quote Conor McGregor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to t- take this time to apologize for absolutely fucking nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's when the professional jellots. We were talking about this in the yep. pre-show. That's when they started coming out. Some of our peers criticizing me, thinking, hey, what are you doing trying to get into policy business? I wasn't doing any of that. It, I was one, I was doing what Chairman Dunford and Secretary Mattis expected me to say. It's what any commander worth their salt will want their senior enlisted to do, to inspire their troops, to, to get them fired up to take the hill or to, you know, come through the the South China Sea or the Persian Gulf, ready to just destroy anything in their place. It was that kind of attitude. And and I wanted to, again, it was to bring to light the brutality that is combat, whether it's ground, air, or sea, and that our troops are out there ready to get after it. And, uh, and, and, And in the end, I was a little disappointed by some of the people that were criticizing me one general officer came to me and said, what would General Dunford think if he heard you say that? And I said, well, why don't you go down to his office and ask him? Because he was on the stage with me in Afghanistan when <laughs> I said it. OK, and uh, he doesn't have a problem with it. So I don't know why you do. Right. So that's kind of how it went. And uh, again, even in retirement, man, I still if I can support the troops, it provides them inspiration. And it's something that, you know, that, that will get them fired up to continue to get after the mission. I'll do it and uh, never apologize for it, man. Absolutely. So I'm going to tell you, this is my gun safe here. This is the room that I video in is affectionately called the gun room. And there's an empty spot right here. And I, I'm going to I'm gonna send you one of those and then I'm going to hang it right here. because I'd this, be honored to do it, brother. This is my command from Afghanistan. This trident was, yeah. this was our guide on. Uh, we, were, we were task group trident. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we decommissioned the command when I left there and uh, an EOD command mass chief may or may not have brought that back and mailed it. It just showed up on my front door one day. So, uh, so there it sits in a, in a, in a place of honor, but I'll be, I'll be honest. It'd be awesome to put that right here and have that in the shot from, from now on. So I'm all in brother. We'll exchange, we'll exchange addresses and I'll get one to you. Um, All right. So, uh, there was one more thing that I wanted to, t- well, two more actually that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, we, we talked about retirement and, yeah. and being that old retired Sergeant major that you are now. Um, you know, t- tell me, tell me what it's like. Tell me what I'm, what I have to look forward to because yeah. I'm 23 months away from retirement. My boss signed my papers today, so it's official. So tell me what I'm, what I have to look forward to. Well, first of all, brother, um, Go get to your transition course as soon as you can uh, and start thinking about it now. Uh, I didn't do that. You know, I thought, oh, like a lot of us senior enlisted, I'll figure it out when I get there, you know. And uh, what I found out about 90 days before I gave up the position of the SEAC, you know, I went to my first transition and I was in there with these other senior enlisted that had like two and three years left. And here's Troxel changing over in 90 days. And then by when I got back, I got a new chairman and a new secretary and they were bright eyed and bushy tailed said, Troxel, pack your shit. We're traveling to Afghanistan, Iraq and all these other places. And I'm like, uh, I got a VA appointment. I got a So, um, so my message is prepare early and, uh, and, uh, make sure that at least 180 days out, you get that separation health, physical examination, so that you can get benefits delivered at, delivered at discharge through the VA disability compensation program. And some some of us, our peers will look like, well, you know, they can give that to somebody else or whatever. No, this is what we've earned through a career of hard knocks. You know, whatever we've been doing, you've been on ships your whole life. 
I know you got plenty of stuff that is has been broken on you and everything. This is compensation for every service member for what they've done to themselves while they've been serving our nation. And we can't look at it like, well, I don't really deserve it or anything. No. So first of all, plan early. Uh, and then the other thing, and we kind of talked about this in the pre-show, I was, uh, as I was getting down to my last few days, I realized there's a stigma about senior enlisted when we retire. A stigma in the fact that uh, some of the general officers and flag officers think that when we retire, the only thing we can do is get a GS job on the base or work at Lowe's or greet a greeter at Walmart or work at range control and, and tell people to cut grass and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, I've been in the military 38 years, one month shy of 38 years, 20 years as a command sergeant major, command senior enlisted leader, a master's degree in strategic leadership. And this is all they think I can do. And so I wanted to, you know, I kind of got energized in the transition course, talking to members of corporate America. And I said, I've got, I want to be goal oriented. I want to retire and get out and get after things that will one, allow me to continue to give back to the active duty veterans and our families and especially our gold star families and our wounded, ill and injured veterans, but uh, also to make life comfortable for my family. We kind of talked about this, you know, our, our senior officers can walk out of uniform, put on a suit and all of a sudden have near millionaire status, you know? So why as we as senior enlisted, why can't we be goal oriented like that and go out and make ourselves <coughs> successful in corporate America? So I started my consulting company, PME Hard Consulting, um, <laughs> aptly named. And uh, PME Hard Consulting is about providing solutions, leadership solutions, and solutions in the human performance domain. And uh, now I work for or assist approximately 15 different organizations now, um, either as a brand ambassador um, or a, you know, someone that is, you know, with the strategic planning, strategic development. Um, or as a an executive consultant in there. And every day somebody is reaching out to either want to talk to me about, an, you know, supporting an event or a cause or an, a corporation or looking for advice and everything. So I say there's three things that we have to do to make sure we're prepared. First and foremost, we, the C senior enlisted especially, have lived a lifetime of selfless service in the United States military. It's all about the sailors. It's all about the soldiers. It's all about the airmen, the Marines and the Coast Guardsmen. And that's not gonna change. Our role will still be, we have to take care of the men and women first. But as you get ready to transition, you have to take that professional military reputation and hopefully, well, I know yours for a fact across the joint force, you have a great professional military reputation. But for those guys and gals out there that are master chiefs or sergeant majors or whatever, and people think you're a shithead, it's going to be tough for you to have a marketable personal brand when you get out if people don't think highly of you in the military. But uh, the bottom line is you take this professional military reputation that's built on selfless service, and you have to rapidly transition that into this, this marketable personal brand that will be attractive to businesses and corporations. This means now you have to have ways to market yourself, to sell yourself. What can you do to assist organizations out there? And you do that by creating this brand, but then clearly defining the knowledge, skills, and attributes that you bring or you could bring to a business or a corporation, whether that's through your evaluation uh, reports that you've had or through your resume or, again, through that reputation. And then you add that on to whatever network you have built. And I, I tell people all the time, uh, I do a lot of leadership seminars with senior lists. And I said, how many of you are on LinkedIn here? And very few of them will raise their hand. And I said, well, you ought to get on LinkedIn and you ought to start making relationships with people mm -hmm. that are out doing things post-military. Because if you combine that marketable personal brand with clearly defined knowledge, skills and attributes, with a robust network, all of that combined will equal 
uh, plenty in, of opportunities to continue to grow and develop in the corporate America and positions that will allow you to continue to have that same purpose, that same direction, that same motivation you had as a leader in the military, and also an opportunity to give back, but finally to make life even more comfortable for your family, which the bottom line is in retirement, that's what it's about, taking care of your family. And is he, I, I, so one of my favorite movies is La Bamba. You know, <laughs> Lou Diamond Phillips played Richie Valens, and, right. and I'm sure you've seen it, and I'm sure your audience has seen it. And Richie Valens, all of a sudden, you know, he was great guitar player, great singer and everything. And Bob Keane, uh, a producer, recognized him. And he brought him to his recording studio. At the time, Richie played in a band with four other guys, good friends of his. But he only brought Richie in. And he brought Richie in and he says, OK, hey, welcome. You know, you know, we're going to, you know, tune up a little bit and then we'll do some recording. And he goes, well, what about my band? He said, well, frankly, Richie, I can't use them. And he goes, well, thanks for the opportunity, but no thanks. And then Keen stops him and says, hey, look, Richie, in this business, you got to think, is it about you or your, is it about your music or your friends? And Richie comes in, he puts his, his guitar and everything down. And he says, it's about my family. And mm -hmm. he chose to stay and the rest was history, you know, uh, in terms of his growth in the music industry. Same way when we retire. You know, it's about our families. You can still give back to the military, which I do every day, you know, uh, either through foundations or supporting our active duty force, you know, that I do all over the globe uh, and also make life comfortable for your family. But it's got to be about those three things, you know, your reputation into a marketable brand, your clearly defined knowledge, skills and attributes with your robust network. And I guarantee, I guarantee Plenty of opportunities will come people's way. Absolutely. I so uh, for me, uh, my drive is always people. Absolutely, yeah. people. And yeah, I, I actually I know we keep going back to recruit training command because that's where we were met where we met. But you know, when I interviewed for that job uh, with Captain Feifel, I, I was actually sitting in Jordan uh, on deployment, and he yeah. we're on the phone, and he asked me. Um, what do you intend on doing when you get here? And I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make the command a family. So, well, it's a big command master chief. I know, I don't know what you're used to. So I understand that, sir. But, uh, everywhere I go, the people I work with are my family, the people, yeah. it's all about the people and family and, and loving each other. Right. Cause I always go to love. Love is what drives me in everything I do. Uh, it's, I think it's the greatest power that human beings possess, but, uh, and, and, and I believe at least, uh, you know, in my own little world and I'm a hero in my own, my own world, just as everybody else is that, yeah. that we created a really good family at RTC while I was there, uh, yeah. you know, we went through a really tough time, a big change. We rewrote the curriculum while we we're there. I'm very, very proud of that. It's kind of the crown jewel of my, my career, but realistically, it isn't even about the curriculum. It's about those sailors that I served with. Yeah. Um, and gave them the tools to, to be successful and, and created a family. I'm still in touch. Th thanks to Facebook. I'm very much in touch with a lot of them. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and then the other thing, I'm not really sure what this says about the two of us. Yours favorite movie is La Bamba and mine is dazed and confused. So I'm really <laughs> not sure uh, what that says about me, but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you know, but hey, that, many quotes right now because it'll yeah. get me in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, the other thing, what you said about uh we it's okay to have self-respect. You know, um it's it's not okay to be self-centered. Right. Uh and certainly people that think when you have self-respect that you should be self-loathing, you know, that you should hate yourself. Well, no, it's okay to have self-respect. Because without self-respect, you're not going to have dignity and honor, and you're not going to have consideration and respect for others. Right. If, you know, if you're self-centered, it's going to be all about you, right. and it's not going to be the people out there. But in order to be able to provide consideration of others and respect, you yourself have to have self-respect, and you got to live with dignity and honor. Because right. if you don't do that, you won't be able to give it away. And a lot of people think, that when we say, hey, self-respect, it means that we're arrogant, you know, or conceited or whatever, and they want us to be self-loathing. 
well, I hate myself because I'm a command master chief or a command sergeant major. And Well, if you're self-loathing, then you're not going to give that respect and consideration to others either. So self-respect is something that all of us have to have inherent to us for our personal growth, but more importantly, for our organizational growth, especially if we're a senior enlisted leader responsible for that organization. So I, I, I absolutely I, agree with you. Yeah, I struggled uh, personally. I, I definitely struggled. I made because I made Command Master Chief so young. I, I struggled with uh, okay, so I've got to be humble, and then it became yeah. to the point where I was almost it was self deprecating, where I would almost pull myself down. Oh no, you know you need to put yourself in check, uh, and then you know you lose confidence through that. And if yeah. you don't have confidence um, as a leader, especially a, a leader of large groups of A type personalities, they will, they'll feed on it. So you yeah. have to, um, you know, with respect, you have to be able to, uh, you know, call people to the carpet, right. And yeah. be okay with that and, and be okay with telling people, Hey, you know, you need to do a better job this next time because yeah. that just wasn't m meeting the mark or, Hey, you need to raise your standards. You're doing a yeah. good job, but the standards can be better. We can do a lot better. And, uh, you know, I did a real short video on standards about, you know, keeping the bar up here, because if this is the minimum standard, where are you on your worst day? You're somewhere down here, but yeah. if you're keeping, it, keeping everything at minimum standard and somebody has a bad day, guess where they're at? They're, they're down there. Yeah. Right? So you got to be able to, as a leader, you know, then we get back to what you said, setting the example, living up here and then being okay with telling people that aren't living up here. Yeah. They need to get their butts up here. Yeah. And that's born out of love. You yeah. know, if, if it was, if, it, if we hated them, we wouldn't care where they would be at, but because mm -hmm. we love them so much. And I used to say this all the time, I'd see a troop jacked up and I'd say, come here. I said, I love you so much. I'm going to chew your ass because you are out of standards right now. You know, <laughs> if I didn't love you, I would let you keep walking and look chewed up from the floor up, you know? So right. yeah, you're, you're exactly right, brother. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So one last thing. Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of the surprise question. I didn't warn you on this one. Um, so, and we're talking about you're you, you were the most senior enlisted man in the mil the person in the military, right? So yes. So for everyone, when I ask you this question, it's going to kind of seem odd, but uh, what is your definition of success? And I, let me let me throw throw mine to you, right? Yeah. So for me, success is an internal thing. It isn't about a title. It's not uh, about, um, it, it's about your own personal goals and where you want to get to in life. So I'm asking you this because you achieved uh, a very high standard in, in, in our organization, in the Department of Defense, and yeah. you work with some very, very senior people. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily, even for you, defines success uh, no. because you're still getting after it in life yeah. after the military. Tell me, um, tell me what your definition of success is. Um, I think success is anyone that uh, is not satisfied with themselves today and looks for personal growth and then to impart growth on those around them so that they will be better tomorrow. And I think that's being purpose driven and everything. You know, having that attitude just happened to get me to be the sea act, but that's not why I was doing it. I want to be a better person every day. I want to be a better leader every day. I want to be a better husband, a better father, a better grandfather. So I'm constantly driving myself to learn and grow because I, I believe that once we turn off the growth and we think we know it all, or we think nothing uh, can surprise us, we become uh, complacent. And once we become complacent, either as a leader or as a uh, father or a husband or in business or whatever, once you become complacent, it's easy for you to become irrelevant and, and ultimately replaceable. So, you know, um, and especially when it comes to being a good husband. All right. If you're not being a good husband to your wife, you know this, brother. Um, you know, all of a sudden you become <laughs> complacent and you take it for granted and, and all of a sudden you become irrelevant. Well, guess what? You're on the fast road to being replaced. Uh, you know? Yeah, it happened to me in my first marriage. So I know all about it. <laughs>
<laughs> hey, I tell people guys like Sean Isbell are a lot better at marriage than I am because I've only done it once. You've done yeah. it three times, bro. Yeah, I screwed so it you up. Got more experience. <laughs> I'm nailing it on the third one. I at least. <laughs> and so oh, I know Heather. Heather. I know she's phenomenal. in the other room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, man, um, it, it, this has been fantastic. I, 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 we probably could talk for another hour or so, but uh, hey. We, we won't be able to hold people that long. It's just yeah. it'll end up just being you and me talking, but yeah. it's great seeing you again. Do you, do you, uh, do you want to finish up with any last words before I close? Yeah, out? So uh, first of all, to you again, Izzy, thank you so much uh, for what you're doing. Uh, you've always been a leader that I've admired ever since I first met you and I saw how you did business at the RCT, but then following your, you know, your, your travels afterwards and what you continue to do, to inspire troops around the world. And now I tell uh, uh, senior enlisted leaders, especially you have to dominate the virtual domain mm. because that's where our troops live. And, and you're doing it, brother, you, you know, doing this podcast, you're motivate uh, and what you're doing with that. God bless you. Uh, keep doing that. And to the audience out there that are on active duty still a hey, God bless you all. Thank you. I can say this now because I'm a retiree. Thank you all. And this includes you, Izzy. Thank you all for defending my freedom. Okay. Because my wars are over and you got two years left, brother, but we are in a contentious environment right now. And you may find yourself facing off uh, in the Persian Gulf again, or worse yet, you know, doing some force on force in the South China Sea with a near peer kind of threat. But uh, thank you all for defending my freedom because now my job is to be at the USO handing out coffee and cookies when you guys get ready to go out on your uh, seven to nine month deployment, or I'll be holding a sign out there at the pier on Norfolk when you're getting ready to push back, brother, saying, be safe, Izzy. Um, I'll leave you with these three things that I know. I knew as the SEAC, and I still know today, nine months after retiring, um, and why we have the greatest military and the greatest nation on the planet. And that's not being self-centered or conceited. It's just the way it is. First of all, we have the ability to defend our homeland and way of life. Even through challenges with modernization and unstable budgets and everything, we still have the ability to do that. We can meet our alliance and uh, partnership commitments. And when you hear people talk about what's going on in the United States with kind of this unrest and everything, and well, other nations look at us and are laughing at us and everything. There's 196 countries in the world. We're in 169 of them militarily right now. We have seven mutual defense treaties. We are the partner of choice around the world for nations that are looking to push back against the Russias and Chinas of the world. So we can meet those alliance and commitments, and we will continue to do that on a daily basis. And last but not least, what I know, we have competitive warfighting advantages in every domain, ground, air, sea, and we have comparative advantages in cyberspace and nuclear. But the greatest advantage we have is in the human domain. Nobody trains, educates, trusts, empowers people like we do. And when it comes to our non-commissioned officer and petty officer corps, it is truly the backbone of our military and the greatest competitive advantage we have because no other nation in the world, and we got great partners, but no other nation in the world will put the kind of responsibility on petty officers and NCOs that we do. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our greatest advantage, and that will never change. So to the audience, God bless you all. Good luck to you in the future. And Izzy, thank you for the opportunity, brother, my, my, my friend, my shipmate, my battle buddy. I'm always here for you if you need me, man. Who yeah, I appreciate that, you know. Um, and and I'm honored to have you on. Thank you so much. I only had one person before you, and that was D. Hairston I had last week. And yeah, he's watching it. He's watching us today. So, uh, uh, you know, just an absolute honor to have you on here. Uh, you know, for everyone else, uh, and thank you, John. Really, thanks, brother. Yeah, I, I really, really appreciate it. But for everyone else, uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at is is motivate and on youtube if you like that big youtube uh things so you can watch it on the big screen i do that with my pops downstairs so you can watch my videos on youtube it's uh there you go he's technically challenged but he gets to watch me you know <laughs> uh and uh and, and i am on linkedin too i do have a page on linkedin and uh, you, you, you we were talking about getting our technical shit together right and uh <laughs> 
for some reason, I'm having an issue getting permission to go onto YouTube. Otherwise, this video would be streaming live there too. Yeah. But eventually, I'm going to get that fixed, and we're going to have all these videos. Or I'm sorry, on LinkedIn. So eventually, I'll have on all three three platforms. Uh, and again, a couple little last pieces of uh, of go juice for everybody. Hey, that cup isn't half full. It's not half empty. It's just waiting to be refilled. Uh, I love you. Mean it. Get out and motivate. Thanks again, John. I really appreciate it, brother. Take care. Well, yeah, shit, mate. Take care, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Who, yeah? Bye, bye.